Okay, so sorry about all the uh, fuss this morning, with the potential room change and then cancel. Um, so it's great that we're all still here in this room, it makes it much easier. Um, there's been, again, another, this week there's been a few internet glitches, so some of the examples I wanted to show, or videos, um, I won't be able to, which is a shame, because I think they illustrate some of the points quite well, especially this week where we're talking about some pretty difficult um, ideas. Um, but I'll put the links up online. The mics, the mic has vanished as well. So yeah, I'll shout extra loud. <coughs> okay, so okay, so we've reached Foucault this week, and pretty pivotal figure, I think. His uh, his legacy is broad, and uh, his work and ideas are quite central to many fields of, of thought and study, okay? Okay, so pretty much any, in any kind of uh, area where there's ideas of knowledge and power, where power is, is exerted upon populations and within populations and on marginalised communities, he certainly remains a very pivotal figure. So we started this course by outlining um, Lyotard's ideas of postmodernity, okay, and how he began to use the term postmodernity. And he used it to name a loss of belief in the stories, or as he said, meta narratives of modernity. Postmodernity introduces a more sceptical and critical approach, if you remember to the ideas of truth or knowledge that form the foundations of society and culture. And we glossed over in that first lecture ideas around of the philosopher from the 19th century, Friedrich Nietzsche. So, his work a century earlier made a similar argument that every aspect of society and culture is historical. By this he means relevant to a particular context Okay? It occurred within a historical context. It's not ahistorical, it's not universal. This includes from so social institutions and moral values, but also that people have fallen into the illusions of considering these aspects natural, eternal and universal. For Nietzsche, what counts as truth, instead of this kind of universal idea, is what counts as truth is strictly historical and changes through different times and between different cultures, okay? So tempora temporally, okay? So in different times and culturally in different cultures, okay? So these are the kind of two main aspects of context, of context that they're descri describing or the, his historic the historicality of what they're describing. So Foucault. Foucault takes up Nietzsche's critique paying particular attention to social institutions like clinics, okay, so clinics for the, me the me mentally ill or for, you know, sexual clinics. He takes it up with regards to prisons and schools. These are his kind of um, case studies. And he does this in order to understand how they have changed and, and approaches to these institutions have changed through history and how they have been used to support particular versions of truth. Like Nietzsche, Foucault argued that history can be used to show the limits of every system of thought, proposing a view of history in which the frameworks of knowledge and modes of understanding are not universal or ahistorical, but are always changing, always changing. Okay, so at this point I'm going to just describe, these are the sort of four key ideas and concepts of Foucault that we're going to be look, con concentrating on today's lecture, okay? And like the previous lectures, I'm going to come back to these, okay, and we're going to try and develop our own definitions of each of these points, okay? Okay, so just bear those in mind. Okay, so we have archaeology, genealogy, which are which are kind of um, just 
describing how, so these are two terms, which are how we understand how Foucault's philosophy of history changes. Okay, so he moves from an architect, archaeological approach to a, to a genealogic, genealogical approach. Okay, and within this, Foucault is, suggest, is, is saying that there are discourses going on. Okay, and we're going to understand what all these three terms mean within how Foucault used them. Okay, so if you look these terms up separately, they may be you, you'll get a different definition to how Foucault employs them. And then we end with biopolitics, okay? But also thinking about governmentality, okay? So again, he's using these in his own philosophical way. So what may have seemed a truth of history can be shown as a product of certain relations of power and knowledge existing at a particular time. He seeks to demonstrate that many of these aspects of culture and society that are considered to be natural, universal, or inevitable are the result of historical changes. Okay, so I'm repeating this point. It is, and to quote Foucault, it is one of my, my targets to show people that a lot of things that are a part of their landscape are the result of some very precise historical changes. Okay, so what does he mean by this? So, things that are part of their landscape, okay? Their landscape, he's using this as an analogy to describe, okay, the world in which they live, okay, the society within which they live, okay, their social interactions. This is what he means by their landscape, okay? So how their landscape, how they exist within this landscape is the result of very precise historical changes, okay? They're not universal, okay? They're not universal rules, which are, which are ahistorical and gone back millennia. They're very they're dependent upon very precise historical changes. So just because things are constructed in certain ways doesn't mean they were inevitable. This was what Foucault means by contingency. That we exist in a present which was not only which was not inevitable, but is contingent upon certain changes, decisions and events. So with this in mind, let's think about how Foucault approached history. His general methodological approach to history is problem-based, always keeping these ethical questions in mind. Who are we? How did we get to, and how did we get to be who we are? How did we arrive at the kind of society we have? The problem might be, indeed, to address one of his case studies. How did the prison emerge as the major form of punishment? Okay, so in the 21st century, if you commit a crime, you go to prison. Okay, in previous historical eras, this was not necessarily the case. This is an institution which has emerged at a particular historical time. Another example might be, how have discourses of sex altered from Greek to Roman, and then subsequently to Christian cultures. Okay? Unlike the conventional view of, history, of the historian as someone who traces a line, okay, a linear line of history, through, of a causal, a causal line of history, giving to history the sense that one thing inevitably leads to another, like a domino effect, Foucault shows that any number of routes may have been may be taken by a history which is discontinuous. Okay, it doesn't necessarily fall in this particular linear line, but rather is isolated in discontinuous chunks. Okay, which then transition to one another, and the, this discontinuity is full of gaps and breaks, rather than being a smoothly continuous. So this is a kind of a uh, very crude um, outlining of his the sort of periods of his work. Okay, so we have archaeology. Remember that from that first slide. Then he moves to genealogy, and then to ethics. But a key a key change occurs if we think about last week <coughs> is the change from this darker blue archaeology to the lighter blue. Okay, what occurs here? 1969 to 1970, what occurs here is a, gen is a move within his work from a structuralist approach 
to a post-structuralist approach. Okay, so we think about 1968 okay, and what occurred there. Think about the work of Bart when he moved from a structuralist approach to a post-structuralist approach. But again, this is quite this is a this is sort of crude understanding, but you know, it is a way of understanding this switch in his work. So Foucault early okay, okay, so I'll just do this. So going back to this conventional ideas of history, okay? So conventional history traces a continuous and inevitable line of causality from the past to the what past all the way to the present, which diminishes the weight of certain localized events. Okay? They become less important when you see history as this long linear line. Okay? The, the, the events of particular times become less important. For Foucault's model for history, there is a discontinuous view of history which is contingent upon the impact of certain localized events on the course of history. Okay? So if something could occur differently at a particular time, history would have moved, moved in a different way. So he's looking at it in, in, in contextualized, okay, rather than a historical universal. So Foucault himself described his early works, so remember his structuralist approach, as archaeology. So archaeology asks, what are the conditions which give rise to knowledge at particular moments? It has been equated to structuralism since it proposes a model of deep structures beneath a surface, which a historian unearths like an archaeologist. So historical archaeology is thus a process of uncovering, step by step, layer by layer, forms of knowledge that over time have produced modern institutions to understand their formation in history. To understand the institutions and systems of power, such as the prison, forms of policing, forms of health provision, such as psychiatric hospitals. To understand how these exist as systems of power in the present, we need to see how they have changed and developed through history and in different historical contexts. Foucault concludes that at different stages of history, certain dominating ideas dictate how things work. For example, in a period of European history when the Christian religion was the dominant source of knowledge, <coughs> this particular truth defined all other forms of knowledge. So, forms of knowledge around law, forms of knowledge around education, forms of knowledge around ethics, social relations, economics, etc. Okay? So, when, when Christian theology is the dominant mode of knowledge, then everything else applies by this. However, he, however, Foucault comes to understand that while one form of knowledge prevails, okay, becomes dominant, rises to become ascendant, such as the Christian church, it is commonly the case, so this is in the West in particular, in Europe, while one prevails, it is commonly the case that various competing ideas are present at the same time. Okay? So it is not just that one form of knowledge exists, even if it is the dominant one. <coughs> There is a competition going on. And the term that Foucault uses to describe these competing forms of knowledge is discourse. And this leads to his second phase of work, so the move from, an arch from archaeology to genealogy. So if archaeology is identifying the discourses at particular moments, okay, genealogy is something else. So okay, archaeology is identifying the context, okay, this discontinuous moments. Okay? So, as one digs down layer by layer, this is archaeology. Foucault then moves into genealogy. Foucault's project was to analyse how human beings understand themselves in their culture and how knowledge about the social world and the individual subject comes to be produced in different periods. <clears throat> what interested Foucault were the rules and practices that produced meaningful statements and regulated knowledge in different historical periods, and he calls this discourse. So he uses discourse to refer to 
a group of statements which provide a language for talking about knowledge, about a particular topic at a particular historical moment. Discourse defines and produces the object of our knowledge. Consequently, it influences our, how ideas are put into practice. Okay, so, it's a group of statements which provide a language for talking <coughs> about knowledge of a particular topic in a particular historical moment. Okay, and this might include competing ideas. Okay, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna sort of elaborate upon this. So discourse can be thought of in a very simple terms as what is said and believed in a particular society at a particular period about a particular social institution. So here I'll, we'll discuss marriage. But by legitimating certain... So what happens with a discourse in, gene, in geal, genealogy with a discourse, you have these competing knowledges, okay? When one achieves ascendancy, one is legitimated. And in that way, okay, it excludes and represses alternative ideas of knowledge. Okay, so an example I have. Okay, up until the 21st century, okay, the dominant form of... So of, of marital sexual relations was heterosexual marriage, okay? Okay, the production of a family. In the 21st century, in Britain and other countries around the world, the discourse, so, so what happens is, uh, previous social religious discourse legitimated heteronormative marriage and thus repressed same-sex relationships. doesn't mean that same-sex relationships weren't going on. They were just repressed and delegitimated. In the 21st century, Britain, the discourse around marriage has changed and same-sex marriage has become leg legitimate, okay? As well as heteronormative marriage. However, this does not mean that other gender and sex subject positions do not remain repressed, okay? For example, transgender groups or other particular sex um, and gender subjectivities, okay? So where the discourse changes, there is still, and the legitima legitimation of a group, there is still a repression of something else. And this is loosely what Foucault is describing with discourse. But if we look back at the initial heteronormative relationships, okay, a discourse of patriarchy once described the difference of the sexes as unequal partners, okay? So when this was the, when this was the dominant discourse, this top one, yeah? This is a discourse of patriarchy. Once described the difference of the sexes as two unequal partners, the male being dominant, okay? And the female being subordinate. It not only established a hierarchy of the sexes, but produced a whole way of thinking about and believing in social differences between the sexes as a natural, God-given fact. Okay, so this discourse has changed, but that was within the, within the structure and institution of marriage, there was a production okay, of a discourse of gender inequality. However, there is never one discourse at work at one single time, but many competing discourses, even if one tends to be dominant. Even in a time of near-universal patriarchy, there were resistances to the patriarchal system in groups of proto-feminists, for example. Because of this non-progressive movement between the overlapping of different discourses, we cannot reduce the ideas and practices of a particular historical moment or period to a single unifying vision. Foucault understandably <coughs> argues for a view of history as a site of conflicts in which a multiplicity, quote, a multiplicity of contradictory discursive elements come into play. So there are many multiplicity, contradictory, opposing, discursive elements, okay, coming into discourse with one another, coming into conversation with it led him to rethink his archaeological method in favour of a model he named genealogy. Okay, so when he understood that there were multiple discursive elements in competition, 
he had to rethink this idea of just looking at um, archaeology as these kind of these chunks, okay, of history, and actually understand it more within these chunks and what the discourses were going on, which led to the next movement and stage in history. <coughs> so this is a, so we move on to genealogy. So I did have some videos, but uh, yes, I'm going to describe some when they, when the sort of easier ones to describe come up. So I might be acting at the front, doing a little play. But anyway, Foucault's later fascination for the role of power within knowledge led him to develop a methodological system. Okay, so a system of thought and approach to the system of thinking that kept many of the essential ingredients of archaeology which took inspiration from Nietzsche's historicizing of moral values. So Nietzsche's genealogy of morality has stressed the idea that morality is not developed in a linear fashion, but is radically contextual, so it's radically within the context of its particular time and place. Moral values are assumed to be something objective and universal, but are in fact utterly historical and change from culture to culture. So, okay, if archaeology expresses a sense of history as an accumulated sequence of discontinuous <coughs> layers, genealogy builds a sense of the active discourses of power. Okay, so we have the layers, as I've just expressed. Genealogy builds a sense of the active discourses of power within these layers, that enable the emergence of different knowledges or discourses at different periods of history. So, again, to reiterate, if, if archaeology asks what are the conditions which give rise to knowledge, genealogy asks what are the constraints that limit or repress knowledge, that produce one dominant form and repress another, that le give legitimacy to one knowledge and prohibit or repress another. The point of a genealogical analysis is to show that a given system of thought uncovered in its essential structures by archaeology was the result, so it's uncovered with archaeology, was the result of contingent turns of history, not the outcome of rationally inevitable trends. It produces something like a history of the present. So we usually associate genealogy with the family tree, okay, that traces our ancestry. So this is a Western form of the family tree. I understand maybe in China or Japan or Korea, the, the family tree might, might appear differently. I don't know. I think last year some students came up to me and said that the family tree didn't look the same. But what these family trees remind us is that the result of this genealogy could have been different. Okay, so don't don't think too much about this as a, actually what Foucault's describing. You wouldn't necessarily describe a family tree. This is an analogy to understand how he approaches it. Okay, so this is not my family tree, but if this is me, okay, how did I come to be here? Okay, if we look at this family tree, it looks as if all of this is inevitable. Okay, that from the first, from Jane Goodridge and Robert Goodridge, right at the top, okay, that that line that pretty much runs all the way down to here was inevitable because, because you only see this marriage and this particular um, relationship which produced the next layer. Okay? Whereas in reality, at any one of these points in history, any one of these layers, if we think about it as Foucault's archaeology, each one of these figures could have chosen to marry somebody else. Okay? So, Charles Wilfrid Goodridge, instead of marrying Florence Gladys Clark here, might have met somebody else. Okay? So, rather than that discourse becoming the dominant one, which has produced me, eventually, Charles could have married somebody else, and that would have produced another line and produced somebody else. So, it's contingent upon that meeting. Okay? between that, that relationship. Okay? For Foucauldian discourse, he's also saying that in history, okay, if we're looking at it through his ge genealogy, certain events which occur to produce 
our present could have, could have happened very differently and produced a very different present. <coughs> so the life of each individual is also a series of choices, okay, just as it is with society. Options present themselves that we choose not to take. Paths open up that we decide not to pursue. And we have the possibility of multiple... So, for instance, one is the possibility of multiple universities, or, in your case, different cult countries to study in. Okay? We choose or legitimate one and thereby reject or repress the other. The life that would have accompanied the, and the life that would have accompanied the other. Okay, so by coming to Goldsmiths and New Cross in London and the United Kingdom, you've made one choice which opens up the possibilities of your life in one way. And if you'd made a different choice, it could have happened very differently. Okay, so we see this in this film. It's a pretty cheesy rom-com, okay? I don't know if some of you have seen it. Um, I'm not going to do a little... Uh, a little play in front of you, but um, basically what happens is our female protagonist, okay, lives two lives, okay, so she, she runs for the tube train, as many of you do, you're late for class, you're running for the tube train, the doors close, okay, one side of the narrative shows how her life um, plays out because she misses the tube train, the other side where she actually made it and got on the tube train Okay, shows how her life pans out in the other way. Okay? I was going to show you the trailer. It's pretty funny. But what happens is her life is radically different. Okay? She, one, in one way, she stays in a relationship which is not particularly great. And in the other one, she breaks up because she finds her husband adult, um, sleeping with somebody else. And she meets someone new who's much more um, compatible. Okay, so this is a kind of an example to illustrate how, within, even within the micro context of our personal lives, okay, okay these, these what-if scenarios, okay, these contingencies, are also true in history, in a broader kind of national, global context. There are, another, there are other examples of these kind of what-if scenarios. Present, presenting very real possibilities that, with a slight shift in historical circumstances, events could have been very different. So what if Germany had successfully invaded Great Britain during World War II? <coughs> As we have that in this novel, now film, Resistance, okay, where there is a British resistance, underground resistance, fighting against an invading German <coughs> army and occupation. Another example is Philip Roth's novel, The Plot Against America, okay, where instead of Roosevelt, okay, who, comes in 19, who is re-elected in 1942 and then uses that to go to war against the Germans in Europe, okay, what if another anti, uh, sorry, pro-Nazi or Nazi-friendly president had been elected at that particular juncture in history, then history would have taken a very different course. Okay, so I've been speaking for a very long time, and I think that maybe at this point, can you, if you think about other examples of novels or cultural um, products that you can think of, which have these kind of what-if scenarios, okay, that, time, that a certain event in history has changed a course, or also talk about your particular circumstances here, okay, what you think you might be able to achieve because you've made this contingent leap, okay, to... Goldsmiths, or this particular leap to Goldsmiths, okay, and what might have been left behind, or the other, what might have been produced if you've made another choice. Okay? So if you just take one or two minutes to talk amongst yourselves, or talk about what I've been talking about, and try and understand with each other what the terms have I've been um, laying out here. Okay? <coughs>
so there's been a lot, of, been a lot of talking, a lot of good conversations going on. Does anybody want to share what they were what they were discussing? Any important points that came up? I know there's lots of good minds and big voices in this room. Run, load, or run? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So do you want to... Uh -huh. So do you want to explain to everybody what, what, what happens no. in run, load, or run? No. No. I can't express. Yeah. Did you enjoy the film? Yeah. Yeah? What, what is it? There were three chants um, about, about him, about her life. And different choice have a different result. Yeah. Okay. So... Run, Load, or Run, which is a German film. Yeah. 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 Okay, so, so it's a film in which the female protagonist has three cho choices in her life, yeah, and each one has different different results. Okay, so this is a great example. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else going to be brave? The thing is, with the, with the movies like Slide and Door, uh -huh. so you get on the train and you meet them. So, Person A, yeah. a banker or something, or well, they don't get on the train and they meet an unemployed actor Right. different lives. But that presupposes that we don't have underlying layers in our own psychology. Maybe okay. we do have socio-political layers within ourselves and they govern our choices as well. Yeah, so, I mean, the film is used as an example of, as a sort of quite crude example. Certainly, we have socio-political, you know, there's no, you don't just meet someone and then your life completely changes. But if you wouldn't have had the opportunity to meet that person and in which your socio-political um, layers, as you've described it, wouldn't be then played, played out, right? But then, it, but then if, you, if you apply that on a societal level... <laughs> You know, in terms of genealogy, what we're saying is particular events happen at particular times, and it's all contextualised. But maybe there, is, maybe there is an underlying layer which is persuasive upon, you know, which way society goes. Yeah. You know, so maybe it's not such a dichotomy. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a discourse that's occurring. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so but it's a multiple, it's a multiple yeah. discourse. So maybe there, there's no such thing as, you know, what he calls the archaeology versus the genealogy. Right, yeah, this is a good point, okay. You've used a really good point, versus. So archaeology and genealogy, as he's described, as he, as he conceptualises them, okay, are not, are not verses, okay, they're not in binary opposition with one another. Okay? It's rather a progression of his thinking. So he, he moves from his structuralist approach of archaeology, which is understanding these kind of layers, okay, that is discontinuous, that history doesn't run in this line, but it's broken down. Okay? And then genealogy comes as his thinking matures, as a way of then understanding what occurs within these layers. Yeah? So it's, you're right, it's not a binary opposition. I'm sorry if I presented it in that way. It is, it is a progression of his thinking. Okay, that's that's important. Yeah. Okay. So I have, I think I managed to get one of the videos up, which we'll come to in a in a minute. Okay. So as I've been expressing, uh, expressing it, Foucault's genealogy also reveals how dominant ideas often emerge through the repression of other ideas, okay? So it's, it's about power relations. For Foucault, throughout history, whole sets of knowledge have been dismissed as undesirable or unimportant. In an age of science, for example, knowledge is considered as unscientific are no longer considered valid. Okay, they're repressed. Genealogy reveals the historical struggle of 
knowledges or discourses to, to gain the upper hand. Okay? There's a struggle. It doesn't just occur. There's a, there's a discourse that goes on. It's a struggle. It's not just, oh, I'm the, I become dominant. There is a period of struggle that occurs. <coughs> this awareness makes it possible to challenge, then, the legitimacy of dominant ideas. Okay, so if you understand that there was a competition, a struggle, where one becomes dominant and the other becomes repressed, then you begin to understand that there is no universal truth behind that dominant form of knowledge, that because there was a discourse, there was a competition that occurred, why the other form of knowledge could have become dominant. Okay? So you begin to be able to critique these forms of knowledge which have become universal. Foucault looks particularly at institutional practices and discourses. So, as I mentioned before, the prison, the clinic, ideas of sexual history, highlighting them as products of particular periods and ideas rather than a natural development. In a series of work that explore the ways in which identities are constructed and policed through aspects of society, like the clinic... <laughs> Like the clinic and the prison, and groups such as the insane, well, okay, the mentally ill. Yes, yes. Are they putting the uh, graduation on? a series of works that explore the ways in which identities are constructed and policed through aspects of societies like the clinic and the prison, and groups such as the mentally ill, the criminal, and the sexually deviant, Foucault's writing questions the ways in which our contemporary social order has been produced, is maintained within the present, and how it might be subsequently transformed. Okay, so to understand how in a particular historical period an institution is formed by one dominant form of knowledge, okay, entering into discourse and then and then repressing the other one, we can then understand how um, these forms of discourse are engaged in our present moment, okay, so not just historically, but how they're engaged in the present moment and how a different future can be produced. Sorry, can I just ask? Yeah. Okay, how does this? Oh, why? Right, because we're looking at how the past has changed, and then... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay. But it's still looking at it as contingent upon certain events going on, okay? Within a particular period. So it's not just that there is a line leading from the past that must... It's not teleological, if you understand how history works in that way, leading to a particular present, but that it's changeable, okay, at different periods, rather than being wholly linear, okay, so that it, it, it can zigzag, okay. <laughs> it's, there is contradictions going on, certainly, okay. Yeah, but, sorry, go on, Carol. It is a line, but it's not an inevitable line. Okay, it's not an inevitable line. So, okay, a genealogy of history is concerned with bringing oppositional, ignored, okay, so oppositional, so the opposed, the ignored and repressed knowledges to the light of day, okay, so to understand how they existed within their particular moments and giving visibility to their struggles and in doing so allowing us to then see how these subjugated groups and struggles exist within the present day. So, genealogy. A genealogy of history is concerned with bringing oppositional, ignored, or repressed <coughs> knowledges to the present day and giving visibility to their struggles. Reveals the historical struggle of repressed knowledges. This awareness makes it possible to challenge the legitimacy 
of dominant and natural ideas. Okay, so okay, we're repeating these 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 ideas. <coughs> In his work on history, Foucault repeatedly returns to the relation of power and knowledge. Okay, so this relationship of power and knowledge, power and knowledge, power and knowledge, power slash knowledge, particularly in the production of subjectivities, particularly the ways power exists as a historically situated relationship, how it is exercised rather than possessed, and can be viewed as productive as well as oppressive. His analysis of power and its intimate relationship to knowledge to what we know is one of his most important contributions to contemporary theory and is essential to his historical method. Power is not just by ruling classes and, individu and individuals and imposed upon those below. Power is at work in every social interaction and can be exercised from numerous positions. And so it remains unstable because every development of power also produces resistances to the power. Okay? It produces this discord. Power and knowledge are then intimately related, each enforcing the other and thereby producing subjects of discourse. Power and knowledge, then, directly imply one another. There is no power relation without the constitution of a field of knowledge, nor any knowledge that does not presuppose and constitute at the same time power relations. Okay? So there is no power relation without the constitution of a field of knowledge or any knowledge that does not presuppose and constitute at the same time power relations. So then how do power and knowledge operate? Knowledge is always inextricably enmeshed in relations of power because it is always being applied to the regulation of social conduct. From a child being told how to behave okay, by their parents to acceptable sexual relations within a society. Okay, so... So that you can't have sex in a certain place, you can have sex in the bedroom or whatever. To also the punishment of criminals, okay? So that criminals are punished in particular culture in a certain way by sending them to jail, okay, for a certain period of time. And in another culture in a different way, okay, where there still remains different forms of punishment. When knowledge is linked to power, it not only assumes the authority of being the truth, but as the power to make itself true, okay? All knowledge, once applied in the real world, has real effects, and in that sense becomes true, okay? Knowledge does not necessarily have to be true, but it only needs to be passed or behave as if it's true. Okay, so as an example of this, this is an example of a discourse of power and knowledge going, um, being played out. Okay, you've probably all seen this. Then explain you did not answer the question. Why did the president send out his press secretary, who's not just the spokesperson for Donald Trump, he can be the he is also serves as the spokesperson for all of America at times. He speaks for all of the country at times. Why? Okay, so Sean Spicer, who is the sec the press secretary for the White House, has made a statement support saying that there were the most number of people at the presidential inauguration. Okay? The video evidence suggests otherwise. So, the, so we have Kellyanne Conway, one of um, Trump's main, President Trump, the new President of America's main spokespeople, okay, being questioned by this news anchor. Okay? And I want you to pay attention between the ideas of truth, what's truth okay, that's going on here, and the discourse that's occurring between these two figures. Times. He speaks for all of the country at times. Why put him out there the, for the very first time in front of that podium to utter a provable falsehood? It's a small thing, 
but the first time he confronts the public, it's a falsehood? Chuck, I mean, if we're going to keep referring to our press secretary in those types of terms, I think that we're going to have to rethink our relationship here. I want to have a great open relationship with our press, but look what happened the day before, talking about falsehoods. We allowed the press spray to come, the press to come into the Oval Office and witness President Trump signing executive orders. And uh, of course, you know, the Senate had just confirmed General Mattis and General Kelly to their two posts, and we allow the press in, and what happens almost immediately? A falsehood is told about removing the bust of Martin Luther King Jr. from right. the Oval Office. That, no, that's just flat out false. And, the and it was writer, corrected immediately. But why, Chuck, but, why but was it said? No, Chuck, no, why was it said in the first place? Because everybody is so presumptively climb, negative. Climb the no, that it's okay. No, it's okay, okay, sorry. It's longer than I wanted, but... <laughs> Spread three thousand times before it was corrected. Excuse me. It does not excuse. Excuse. And you did not answer the question. I did. No, you did not. You did not answer the question of why the president asked the White House press secretary to come out in front of the podium for the first time and utter a falsehood. Why did he do that? It undermines the credibility of the entire. White House press office no, on day don't one. Be so, don't be so overly dramatic about it, Chuck. What it, it, you're saying it's a falsehood, and they're giving Sean Spicer, our press secretary, gave alternative facts to that. But the point really is... Alternative facts? Alternative facts, four of the five facts he uttered. The hey, one Chuck, thing he got hey, Chuck, with Zeke Miller, four of the five facts he uttered were just not true. Look, alternative facts are not facts. They're falsehoods. Chuck, do you think it's a fact or not that millions of people have lost their, their plans or health insurance and their doctors under president? Okay, so what's the point in showing that? Okay, so the point is, we are, what is displayed in this video is a, is a discourse about what is truth and what is not truth, okay, between the news media and their production of fact or truth, okay, and the new American governmental regime, okay, so... We're still existing within this discourse. This is not being resolved. One has not repressed fully the other. Okay, there is still discourse going on. What it shows is that there is a, a relationship between power and knowledge. Okay, they're struggling between each other for 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 legitimating and repressing the other one's form of knowledge. Yeah, through relationships of power. <coughs> So two sides are exerting their own forms of knowledge in a tussle for power to claim and legitimate their form of knowledge and repress the other. Okay? There may also be many other multiple forms of knowledge okay, being exerted at the same time. This is two going on. Okay. So knowledge always then operates in specific historical contexts and institutional regimes. According to Foucault, what we think we know in a particular period about crime, for instance, has a bearing on how we regulate, control, and punish criminals. Foucault's approach is to look at power from below and at ground level, so a microphysics of power. And it is the human body which is the most specific point at which micro strategies of power can be observed. Hence is on fo his focus on biopolitics, political discourse that operates at the level of the individual subject. Control of the populations is achieved through control of individual bodies. And this kind of, Foucault suggests that this really starts to occur in the 19th century. So rather than through direct repression, okay, control in modern societies is achieved through more invisible strategies of normalization at the level of the individual. So I was going to show you a video from um, the film of 1984, the novel, okay? I was going to show you a film of the, the main character doing exercises in front of a telly screen, okay, which is a screen within the house which observes him, okay? So he has to do these exercises to remain fit, to become a, 
um, a legitimate member of, of this regime, the society within this particular regime, is to do these exercises, okay, and he's being watched and observed and dictated. So this is a perfect example of biopolitics in action. Okay, they're exerting control over the individual body and they're watching you. Individuals then regulate themselves according to strategies of power and knowledge, which he goes on to call governmentality. This is nothing to do with a government necessarily, but I'll go on to describe what it means. But rather it's a way of governing or regulating oneself. Foucault's focus on governmentality marked an important change in his thinking around issues of control in modern societies. One of the theories Foucault has become particularly synonymous with is his adoption of the panopticon, the ideas around the panopticon. So the panopticon, what's the panopticon? So it's a mode of surveillance, regulation and discipline used in institutions as wide-ranging as factories, hospitals, schools, but most particularly prisons. Okay? It's a theory that comes out around in the late, 19th, uh, late 18th, early 19th century, by a, a thinker called Jeremy Bentham, okay? He's a key figure in the, in the production of UCL in London. Okay, and you can go and see his corpse at UCL, which is beautiful. Um, the Panopticon is based okay, on the architectural pr principle of a ring-shaped building with cells grouped around a central tower. So in this we can see one half of this ring, the central tower. In the central tower, there's one guard who can look into every single one of the cells. Okay, so they can be watched from this centre the whole time. So how does this relate to governmentality of individuals outside of the prison structure? Okay, each prisoner feels the weight of surveillance until they end up interiorising it to the point of observing and policing themselves. So they begin to behave well within their cells, each cell, because they know that they're being watched okay, at all times. If, if they know they're being watched at all times, they begin to behave and conform to the rules. So, as Foucault's work on panopticism shows, power in the modern era is increasingly based upon surveillance. Defects may begin in institutions like prisons, hospitals and schools, but they spread out of these specific locations to involve the whole of society in forms of panoptic surveillance. So this could be the internet and methods such as CCTV cameras as particular examples of the pervasion of surveillance. So, you know, being tracked on everything you look at on the internet, this is a mode of surveillance, even if it's but not just by governments, okay, but the use of cookies and other forms of tracking your internet, your internet um, usage, okay, which is then... Um, feeds back in the adverts you receive. So this is a form of panopticism. So rather than authoritarian practices of governance, panopticism can be seen as active in governmentality, a form of self-governance and self-regulation. Okay, so you receive these certain adverts and then you start to click on the adverts and you start to then enter into a self, and then it keeps repeating, you start to govern yourself because all you see are these particular feeds from the internet, these particular um, adverts or news stories. So, governmentality describes the internalisation of social norms, leading to a regulation of conduct based upon an awareness of social visibility. Okay, so I begin to act in a certain way because of these influences, okay, because someone's paying attention to what I'm doing, okay, whether it's whether it's me walking down the street, I act in a certain way because I'm being watched. Okay, I feel, I believe that I'm being watched, so I act in a certain way to conform to the social norms. Okay, so this is a form of biopolitics, but it's also a form of self-governmentality. I've internalised the social norms. Okay, so we're now going to kind of conclude. Okay, so that's governmentality. When forms of surveillance become so widespread and invasive such as CCTV or the internet, social media, individuals police themselves. 
and, that, and how they behave in private and in public, because they exist under the constant threat of being watched. Okay? Or because all they receive are images of people with a certain body shape, so they conform to that body shape. So a, I know there's a lot going on in this lecture, but okay, we're gonna, I'm going to try and conclude briefly. So in Foucault's very last book, The History of Sexuality, Part 3, published shortly before his death, he offered a philosophical route opened up by a notion of discourses as genealogical, i.e. historical, not natural or inevitable. So in his development of genealogy, so his de this development of genealogy is not only about how we have come to be who we are, but is also about how we can become who we want to be. Foucault's ethical concerns appear here. He tells us that we must not work on ourselves, so that we, sorry, that we must work on ourselves, okay? So that he tells us that we must work on ourselves. We must take responsibility for inventing and producing our own self. We recognize the contingencies, okay? The chance occurrences. So if we recognize the contingencies, these chance occurrences and cultural rules that, we, that have made us who we are, we can also acknowledge the contingency that determines who we will be. He describes this as a critical ontology of ourselves, a quest for a form of freedom through work carried out on ourselves, by ourselves, as free beings. This capacity for self-invention recognises the power-knowledge relations of the discourses within which we are all involved, within which we are subjectivised, but also the possibilities of resistance to these discourses. And it enables us, and I'm finishing now, it enables us to ask who are we and who do we want to be?